Good morning. Welcome to worship this second Sunday in Lent. I'm so glad you chose to be with us during this time. We will have communion as part of our service, so please prepare your bread and your uh, juice or wine so that it's ready for us when we come to the meal. Again, welcome and thank you for being here. Let's take a moment to quiet our hearts and minds as we prepare ourselves for worship. Together, we turn to the Spirit of God, drawing us together in love. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our guilt is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the Spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving grace, excuse me, by the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Our gathering prayer. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the 22nd Psalm. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. 
From you comes my praise in this great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the lands of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow down before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel for this second Sunday in the season of Lent from the eighth chapter of St. Mark. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. 
It's time for children's message, and I just want to share a few things with you this morning. On the Sunday page, where the Sunday school materials are, you'll see that the Old Testament lesson is from Abraham and Sarah. It is about making a covenant with God, and, um, or rather, God made the covenant with Abraham and Sarah, and they're pretty young when that happens, and Lots of things happened in their life. I hope you read the story. And at the end, um, the promise of a son is fulfilled when Sarah is 90 and Abraham is 99. So a ripe old age to become parents. But what I want to talk to you about is uh, blessed to be a blessing. How do we share the gifts and blessings that are sent our way? Well, I happen to uh, have told you before that my husband likes old cars, and uh, before COVID, we used to have a a little uh, gathering of people, and so I would look for things that I could share. And for for almost a year now, I've had uh, this package that has two gliders in it, and they've just sat in the bag and haven't gone anywhere, haven't done anything. And so I was thinking about how do we share the blessings that are given us? And you may wonder, how on earth could that be a blessing, a glider? Well, I think that when we have two gliders, we can share with someone else. Could be a sibling, or it could be a neighbor, or it could be a school friend. But God gives us other gifts too, Uh, lots of gifts. And in this congregation, there are a lot of gifts that God has bestowed upon us. So I want you to think, what gift has God given you? Maybe it's the gift of being uh, an usher, or maybe it's the gift of um, leading meetings. Maybe it's the gift of making phone calls. Maybe it's the gift of listening on the other end when someone needs someone to talk to. Lots and lots of gifts. But if we don't do anything, if we don't unwrap them, unwrap them, we don't use them. And so I was thinking, if I had the opportunity to share a gift of a blessing, I'm a little out of practice here, but... If I had the gift of sharing a blessing, it would go out from me to someone else like this. And I could do that with somebody that I just met. I could share my blessing with a new person. I could share my blessing with a sibling who's stuck in the house with me, and we could have contests to see how far we could make it go and and other things. But you know... When we have something that's just stuck in a package, when our gifts are just stuck inside of us, nothing happens. And even in this time of COVID, the gifts we have can be shared, the gifts from God can be shared with others. So I want you to think about how the child, the fulfillment of the covenant, the blessing from God, and it came in God's time, not not human's time, how our gifts, when we look at them, how they can be shared with others. So I want you to do that this week. I want you to think about the gift you have and share it with someone else. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gifts you give us so freely. Help us to be aware of them. And Lord, help us to share them among the people that come into our lives. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A man named Calbraith Perry Rogers is a little-known pilot who in the year 1911 made the first coast-to-coast crossing of the United States in an airplane. On September the 17th, 1911, he took off from Long Island, just outside of New York City, and 49 days later, he landed in Long Beach, California. 
However, of those 49 days that he was traveling, he was only actually up in the air flying the equivalent of three days, 10 hours, and 14 minutes. He needed the rest of the time because, because during the journey, he crashed 39 times. He also made another 30 unexpected, unscheduled stops in order to fix his plane to keep from crashing some more. So many parts of his plane broke along the way and had to be replaced that when he arrived in California, there were only two original parts that were still on the plane that he had left with, a vertical rudder in the back of the plane and a drip pan underneath the motor. When he got to California, it was a new plane and he was a new person. But what kept him going was, was a vision for what he was doing and the importance of what he was doing and a love for what he was doing that was more important than survival. And what he also learned along the way is that there are just times when you need to stop and let go of and leave behind the parts that aren't working, which was in his case, most of the plane. We, you and I, are in the midst of a, of a 40 day journey. We are in, on day 10 of the journey through the season of Lent. And Lent is also a time in which, like Calbraith Perry Rogers, we get in touch, we get a sense of what our vision is, what is it that we love, and who is it that loves us. But also we learn that there are times when you just gotta, you gotta let go of what's not working. Lent can be thought of as a, as a spiritual journey, as a, as a spiritual experience, <clears throat> not just for us as individuals, but for us collectively as well. We're on this journey with two purposes in Lent, I would say. One is to, is to let ourselves uh, sink down into the love of God, to let ourselves be opened by God's Holy Spirit to really receive the, the constant love that God has for us. But as we receive that love, as we receive the sense of God's embracing us, we are also set free to let go of the things in our life that aren't working, to let go of the things in our life that aren't healthy, whether those are our fears or whether they are patterns of how we treat ourselves or how, or how we treat other people. Lent is a time to, to reach out in a new way and to begin to discover who God is calling us to be. What's interesting is that the Old Testament lessons during this particular year in the season of Lent all have to do with God taking people on a journey. They are all the main uh, covenant stories in the Old Testament, stories when God made a covenant, when God made a pact with people, when God sealed a relationship with people. But no sooner had God made a covenant with them and embraced them that God took them on a journey. And so think about it. Last Sunday, the first Sunday of Lent, it was God taking Noah and his family on a journey, God putting them into an ark. They had to leave everything behind except the animals that were with them and venture out into the unknown. In today's Old Testament lesson, it's Abraham and Sarah. God also invited them to leave behind the comfort and familiarity of their home and Ur of the Chaldees to follow God to a, an entirely new land. Next week, the Old Testament lesson is gonna be about God taking the children of Israel on a journey when God frees them from slavery in Egypt and puts them on a 40 year journey through the Sinai wilderness to take them back to the land of Israel. God takes us on a journey in which we learn to trust God, experience God loves, but then to let go of what's not working. In the New Testament, that journey theme continues when Jesus calls all the disciples together. But as soon as he does that, Jesus takes them on a journey through the, through the highways and byways of Galilee, through Samaria, down to Jerusalem itself. When we, when we entrust ourselves, when we entrust ourselves to God, when we are filled with God's love, God takes us on a journey in which we are, are remade, in which we become someone new. Jesus says to us during Lent, look, it's time to be honest. Take an honest look at your life. If you're gonna crash 39 times, you might as well learn something from it. So what do you need to let go of and leave behind? I ran into an old friend of mine the other day whom I had gone to college with, and we hadn't seen each other for probably 15 years, so it was good to just kind of catch up on things. And when I asked him how he was doing, he said, generally I'm doing good. He said, but I'm, he said, I'm very sad about what's going on with my extended family right now. He said, he said, when my five brothers and sisters, when all of us get together, 
we used to be so close, but now we are uh, so caught up in our arguments. We are so caught up in what we disagree about. We were all together at Christmas and we argued about politics. We argued about the church. Uh, one of my brothers clearly drinks too much, but if you try to confront him about that, he gets defensive. And then the rest of the family is split over whether he should be challenged around this or not. We used to be so close, but now it feels like each one of us is just caught in this in this tight grip of our anger and our resentment towards each other and arguments we hardly remember the beginning of, I just wish somehow we could be set free of that. I wish we could let go of that. I remember a spiritual practice that a counselor once taught me years ago that seems to match this theme of Lent, of part of the Lenten journey being to let go of what's not working and to be made new by God. So it really fits into to Lent. Some of you have heard me describe this uh, spiritual practice before, but it fits so, so well with Lent, I just couldn't bear but, but share it with you again. And this is, this is how it goes. This is, the, this is the spiritual practice. You can be sitting down or you can be standing up and you put your elbows in at your sides, but then you kind of reach your arms out like this to begin with, with your, with your palms facing down and then close your palms, kind of clench your fists and then slowly open them up as though you're letting go of something. And then you pray, dear God, help me release all of my anger, all of my pain, all my patterns that hurt me and other people. Then you turn your hands over so that they're facing up in a receiving position and you continue the prayer. You say, dear God, fill me with your comfort, your peace, and the power to forgive. Amen. It's a spiritual practice of asking God for help in letting go. When you, I would recommend to you that, you that you use that spiritual practice once a day for the rest of the Lenten season as part of your your prayer that God helps you be, become remade and made new. And as you, as you start the process, as you, as you start it first with your palms closed and facing downwards, think about what are the things that are holding you. Think, think, think about the patterns that hold you and that you're holding on to. In our individual lives, that could be our anger, our fears, our resentments towards each other. It could be an addiction. It could be self-judgment when we're judging ourselves even more than other people do. And then also think about what are the, what are the forces that are holding on to us collectively right now? Right now in our country, there is, there is so much violence. There is so much uh, verbal assault of one another. There's so much racism. There's so much cynicism. There's so much competition. So think of the things that aren't working either individually or collectively and, and begin the prayer and say, dear God, Help me to release, help me to release as you open up your fingers. Help me to release my anger, my pain, and all the patterns that hurt me and others. And then turning with the palms up, say, and dear God, fill me, fill me with your comfort, your peace, and with the power to forgive. Amen. I wanted to bring a pomegranate with me today, but I found out that pomegranates are not in season right now. I called at least three different food stores and went to a couple of those who just don't have pomegranates. But I wanted to bring a pomegranate because, uh, because I love pomegranates. And one of the things I love about them is that when you, when you peel them open, there's all these different chambers of the little pomegranate seeds inside. You, op you peel it open and you eat all the little pomegranates right there, and then you got to peel it some more, you gotta open it some more and there's a whole nother chamber of pomegranates and then you eat those and then you, you tear it open some more and there's more pomegranates. And they just are, are uh, symbolic in so many ways. And in fact, in scripture, in the Old Testament, pomegranates are mentioned a number of times. And when God is taking the Israelites to Egypt and needs to give them kind of a pep talk along the way, tries to keep their spirits up, God says to the Israelites, when you get to Israel, there's gonna be seven delicious fruit and grains there, including pomegranates. God says, dream about the pomegranates that you're going to get in Israel. And in the Jewish tradition, each pomegranate has 613 seeds in it. 
And those 613 seeds represent the 613 key teachings in the books of Moses, the Torah, teachings about God's love for us and how we can live in unity with God. And so the pomegranate was not just a delicious fruit, but it, was, it, it pointed to God's whole relationship with us. In the Christian tradition, what's interesting is that in the Middle Ages, in the 1400s and 1500s, when Christian artists would paint a painting of, of Mary holding the newborn baby Jesus, Mary would often have Jesus in one arm and with her other hand, she was holding a pomegranate. Or sometimes it was little Jesus holding a big pomegranate in his little hand. Or sometimes Mary and, G and Jesus were holding the pomegranate together. And for Christian artists in the Middle Ages, the pomegranate was symbolic of many things, but particularly about three things. First of all, that the pomegranate with all of its, all of its new chambers of delicious fruit was a symbol of God and all of the chambers of the mystery and of the love of God. That no matter how much you knew about God, there's always something more to discover. And no matter, no matter how much love you had received from God, there was always more love to receive. So like eating a pomegranate and coming upon chamber after chamber, it was a symbol of, of, the, of the bounty of God's mystery, but also God's love. Secondly, the second thing that it was uh, symbolic of for the artists is that it was a, the pomegranate was a symbol of God holding us together in community. All those uh, 613 pomegranate scenes kind of all squished together inside a pomegranate was a symbol of, of all the people of the world, all the people of the world being held by God as family. We get separated in so many ways and we look at each other and we think we're different and we pull away from each other and we say we're separated by the color of our skin or the language we speak or, or the language we use in our theology. But God, said the artist, is like a pomegranate who just holds us all together no matter what. And then the third symbol of the pomegranate was in the, the, the red juice of the pomegranate seeds, the tart, sweet juice, which made them think about the Last Supper and how God uh, fed the disciples with his own blood and body, the bread and the wine, and that how on Good Friday, uh, God's love and Jesus' love was poured out for the sake of all people through the shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross. The pomegranate, they said, is a symbol of the mystery of God, of the community in which we are gathered, and of God continually showering us and flowing over us with God's love and God's mercy. So we are in this Lenten season. We are on this Lenten journey, you and I, a 40-day journey, a journey with God in which we sink down again into God's love, but in which we also ask God to set us free from what holds us, to, to allow us to be remade as new people. And so God does that, like a pomegranate with 613 seeds. God comes to us with all these gifts that enable us to be remade, the gifts of grace and forgiveness, the gifts of, of honesty, the gifts of the awareness that we are one community together, the gifts that God continually fills us. That is God's covenant promise to us. That is the journey of faith, that we follow God and live. Amen. Yeah.
join with me as we profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. On this second Sunday of Lent, let us pray for the church, the world, and all people in need. God of mercy and might, bless your church throughout the world. Uphold those believers who suffer for the sake of your gospel. Strengthen the faith of all the baptized and make your presence felt by those unable to assemble for worship. As this week we commemorate John and Charles Wesley, we ask you to bless the Methodist churches around the globe. Unite them in the promise of baptism, and in due time, return us all to the joy of singing the hymns that Charles wrote. All the ends of the earth worship you, from galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to live respectful of nature and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Continue to watch over the people of Texas and surrounding states who are still suffering from food and water shortages and damage done to homes as a result of the recent winter storm. Bless the nations of the world. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Lead all people around the world to receive the COVID-19 vaccine with gratitude to you. Grant to our Congress the wisdom and the will to improve the lives of all our residents. In Jesus, you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving. Comfort all who are dying. Lead us out of the practices of discrimination. Bring vindication for victims of injustice and relief to oppressed minorities. We remember before you the family of Frank, the family of Dorothy, the family of Pastor Gordon, June, Otto, Dave and Cindy, Rena, Laura, Michelle, Dean and Vivian and family, Lynn, Kelsey, and family, Steve, Brian, and Scott. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Protect women in childbirth. Accompany everyone who lives alone. Equip the ministries and services of church and state that attend to families in their needs. Praises to you, O God, for centuries of saints whose faithfulness inspires our Lenten journey. Bless those who mourn the 500,000 people who have died of the coronavirus. Be our way, our truth, our life, 
and strengthen our faith in the gift of your final salvation. We entrust ourselves and our prayers to you, O God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As we are forgiven and reconciled to God through Christ Jesus, let us be reconciled to each other. The peace of the Lord be with each and every one of you always. You know, at, if we were here together, this would be the time of our in gathering for tithes and offerings. I just want to thank each and every one of you for your continued support for the ministry here at Good Shepherd. Let us pray. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed our right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise, united with the church on earth, all creation, and the host of heaven, we say, Holy, holy, holy are you, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in your name. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, our living water and our merciful guide, together with rivers and seas, wells and springs, we bless and magnify you. You led your people Israel through the desert and provided them water from the rock. We praise you for Christ, our rock and our water, who joined us in the desert, pouring out his life for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us hear Christine sing the Lord's Prayer.
Jesus draws the whole world to himself. Come to this meal and be fed. The body of Christ, broken for you. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives may bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
the blessing. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. And I invite you to go in peace and share the good news with someone that you know. Thanks be to God.